um, and I hope that you enjoy it. So the topic is using inverse optimization for measuring clinical pathway concordance. And uh, what I'm gonna talk about it, it is uh, like the analysis, it is in this paper that you can find it online. So it is published online. Um, so here today, I will just go over some of the methodology and also mention the application in stage three colon cancer. Now let's first see what is a clinical pathway. So clinical pathways are recommended sequence of activities that outline best practices for managing a specific disease or patient cohort. For example, here is a clinical activity, um, a clinical pathway, basically, that is the diagnosis and treatment clinical pathway for stage three colon cancer. So this sequence is what we call the clinical pathway. It is recommended by medical experts with the hope of optimizing patient outcomes. So the goal is to optimize patient outcomes such as survival. So based on this pathway, patients will uh, should go through endoscopy, abdomen CT, pelvis CT, and all the way through chemotherapy. And it should be in this order. So we also call this, this sequence, the reference pathways, because, uh, because sometimes clinical pathway can mean a broader term, like uh, in clinicians also might include like the surgeons, the number of resources that is uh, dedicated to the patient and so on in their broader clinical pathway. But in this research, we just mean this sequence. And that's why uh, just uh, we changed the methodology to reference pathways. Now it is proved that if patients follow the reference pathways, the, their outcomes will improve. Outcomes such as survival, wait times, complication rates, and also lengths of stay in the hospital. Now, in reality, patients don't always follow the clinical pathways or the reference pathways. They deviate from them for many different reasons. It can be from the patient's side or it can be from the clinician's side. But anyway, there are some differences. For example, here is a real patient pathway. And this one is the reference pathways. So they are supposed to follow this, uh, this uh, sequence of steps. But here you can see that there are two extra uh, clinical activities, for example. This one is another actual patient pathway and it is missing some of the activities from the reference pathway. And finally, it, uh, this one is another patient pathway and there are some deviations. For example, the first two activities are swapped there are two extra activities and also some of the activities are missing. Now, all these deviations, they can happen in real life. And now we define concordance as the degree of alignment between the recommended standard care, which is the reference pathway and the actual care that happens, which is the patient pathways. So the goal is to quantify to measure the alignment of each of these patient pathways to the reference pathway. So at the end, we are looking for something that some, some metric that would be like, okay, this patient pathway is 60% concordant, this other patient pathway is 40% concordant. Now, why do we even want to quantify concordance? Because if we can quantify concordance, then we can monitor the variations in the healthcare system, for example, between two geographical locations, between subpopulations, and that will help to find the bottlenecks, the inefficiencies in the system. And that will help policy uh, decision makers to make some informed decisions using the data-driven uh, facts. They can, use, uh, they can use the facts and to make some uh, informed decisions. And all of this at the end will result in improving the healthcare system quality, which can save lives. 
Now, the question is how we should quantify concordance of a patient pathway to the reference pathway. And secondly, what are the roots of discordance or the sources of discordance in the population? And the second one is actually important. So in the first question, we are just trying to measure concordance and uh, that is a tool to find out what are the sources of discordance in this healthcare system. So as you might have guessed from the topic, we use inverse optimization to do that. Now, first, let's see what is inverse optimization. So in a broad term, inverse optimization refers to inferring unknown parameters of a problem, a decision-making problem, based on some observed decisions. Now, let's see it in a simple example. So let's say we have uh, the constraints and this is the cost vector. Uh, I'm, I'm calling it a cost vector, but actually we are maximizing it. So it is the objective function vector. This is the, uh, our feasible region. So in a traditional optimization problem, we are looking for an optimal solution, right? And here we can just solve the problem and find it. Now in the inverse setting, we have some of the parameters, but we don't know some other parameters of the problem. For example, let's assume that in this simple example, we know the feasible region, we know the constraints and we can build a feasible region, but we don't know the objective function coefficients. However, we are given this point over here and we assume we somehow know that that is the optimal solution. Now, inverse optimization will help us to find the cost vector and objective function vector that uh, makes this point optimal for the problem. Now, in reality, the observations can be just noisy and there can be multiple observations. So these observations, they can, uh, they can come from some uh, decision make maker who makes multiple decisions like every time, for example. So in reality, yes, we will have something like this. Some of the data points are noisy. Some other data points are even infeasible. But also in this setting, the inverse optimization methods will help to find a a cost vector that makes the points as close to optimal as possible. Now, let's just assume this is just a suggested cost vector for this problem. And I'm drawing the level set so that I can show you like what is the notion of optimality or suboptimality or the duality gap. So if this is the cost vector and we have the level set, then this other point, it has some optimality gap, right? So it is not on the level set, the optimal level set, but it is just, it has some deviation, which uh, we can call it the suboptimality gap or just the duality gap because it is an LP. Now the point on the level set, it has zero optimality gap or duality gap, and the other point has some uh, duality gap. Now, just like this, if we take another cost vector, like this one over here, the duality gaps, they change. For example, the first and second point, they have zero duality gap, and the third point it still has some duality gap. Now, this is just a notion of suboptimality that we define here, and inverse optimization will help to find the cost vector that minimizes a function of this these uh, aggregate suboptimality. For example, like will minim uh, inverse optimization will minimize the sum of the absolute duality gaps or sum of the square duality gaps. And that is how we end up finding the cost vector. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, so. Inverse, before going into the details of how we use inverse optimization, just wanted to quickly mention 
inverse optimization has found so many applications in the uh, literature. For example, in revenue management, it can be used to solve bi-level revenue maximization problems. Or in electricity markets, inverse optimization is used to uh, is used in recovering the market structure from the observed decisions, from observed prices and the decisions. And finally, in healthcare, it has lots of other applications. For example, it is used to automate radiation therapy treatment planning. Now, today I'm just gonna talk about one application of it, which is novel, but I just wanted to uh, let you know that there are just so many other applications. Now, back to the using inverse optimization for measuring clinical pathway concordance, let's see how we do it. So first of all, we, we built this graph, the network, using the clinical activities that patients can undertake. The nodes, as you can see, they are the clinical activities. And we can map each patient pathway and each reference pathway to this graph, like this, okay? So basically, this means that this reference pathway starts, this is the artificial start node. It goes through endoscopy and then abdomen CT and pelvis CT, so on. So we assume that as patients traverse this graph, and they undertake these clinical activities, they are accumulating some costs. So the costs are basically the lengths of the arcs or just simply the arc costs. Now, the question is, what are these arc costs? Now, you might see the connection a little bit. So we use inverse optimization here. Why? Because we want to find our costs such that reference pathways become optimal solutions for the shortest path problem on this graph. Okay, so now you can see the connection between the simple example I showed you. So the reference pathways are the optimal solutions, the ones that we assume they are optimal. We have a shortest path problem. We don't know the R costs, and that's why we use inverse optimization. So the inverse optimization approach we have, it is a two-phased approach. First of all, I'm just gonna give you an overview of the approach, and then I will go into the details of uh, the two steps that we have here. So as I mentioned, we have the reference pathways as the data points. We input them to a phase one inverse optimization model. And the goal there is to make the reference pathways optimal for the shortest path problem. Now, we actually record the duality gaps for these points, the epsilons, right? So we record them and we input them to a second phase inverse problem, where we also incorporate patient pathways there. So we also include some data points from the observed patient pathways here. Now, I will explain in detail like uh, what, what is this phase one, what is phase two, uh, but overall it is, uh, it is like this. So the reference pathways are the optimal solutions for the shortest path problem. Now here we bring the patient pathways because we want to refine the cost vector that we get and uh, that patient pathways will be divided based on their outcomes. So just bear with me, I will show you uh, what these are exactly. So after solving these two phases, we will have the R costs, which are used in designing a concordance metric, okay? Now, what is phase one? So as I explained in phase one, the reference pathways are the only inputs, like they are the data points that we want them to be optimal solutions for the shortest path problem. 
On top of that, we definitely need the network parameters to be uh, to be like enter to this formulation, as you can see. And P denotes the dual vector. C is the cost vector, the variable that we are looking for. Now, how we model the inverse problem is using the duality theorem. So, in in linear programming, when we want uh, we, when we want to infer the parameters, we can actually replace the optimality conditions. So here we are saying that the reference pathways are optimal solutions for a shortest path problem. So now we can replace that uh, shortest path problem by using its uh, dual constraints. Let me show you the constraints now. This one is the dual feasibility constraint then. And this is the strong duality. So these are the two required constraints that we want from the dual problem so that the reference pathways are uh, can be optimal for the shortest path problem. However, in the strong duality one, we also introduce the epsilons. These epsilons are the same as the one that I showed you in the simple picture. So these are the duality gaps for the reference pathways. And we have them because it is possible, uh, as I showed you, that there doesn't a cost vector that makes all the reference pathways optimal at, this, at, at the same time, uh, but we want some cost vector that makes them as optimal as possible. And that's why we have this epsilon here. Now in the objective function, we minimize the sum of the square duality gaps. So that is just uh, the function that uh, we minimize in inverse optimization. We, we want them to be close to optimal. So it is just natural to minimize the epsilons. And the other two constraints, uh, they are just for uh, other purposes. For example, this constraint over here is for normalization purposes. This will, uh, uh, this will actually make sure that the cost vector that we find is not all zeros. And finally, this last constraint over here it makes sure that the cost vector lies in the lower dimensional space that the network flow problem or the shortest path problem creates. Now, uh, this one can be a little bit abstract. So uh, maybe we can just imagine it in 3D. So in 3D, imagine that there is this feasible region, which is a plane, okay? Um, so it is lower dimensional in 3D. So uh, let's say we are in 3D and this, uh, my hand is actually a plane in 2D. It is the feasible region, okay? Now, uh, we are looking for a cost vector in 3D, okay? So it can direct to any direction in 3D. So the problem without this constraint, it can give us a cost vector that is like this. So it is orthogonal to this plane and it will make every point on this plane optimal. So that is uh, not what we want because in that case, the cost vector will be uh, informative and we cannot distinguish between optimal solutions and feasible solutions. So we make the cost vector to lie on this plane. So that is what this constraint does. Is all good? Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer at any point. Okay, so just to summarize, this, this formulation is trying to find the cost vector and also the duality gaps that make the reference pathways very close to optimal. However, uh, so the, the graph that we build usually is big, but there might be just a few reference pathways, for example, two or three reference pathways. And uh, therefore, like the problem can have multiple uh, solutions. So there, there might be multiple cost vectors that make these uh, reference pathways optimal in the same level. Now, that's why we also have a second phase. So from here, we just get the duality gaps 
and input it to a second phase immerse problem. Now, in this phase, as I mentioned before, so we have two sets of patient pathways and we enter it to, to the problem. So the first set, it includes patient pathways with positive outcomes, and the second one includes patient pathways with negative outcomes. And the outcome of interest for us in this uh, project was four-year survival. So basically the two sets, they include patients who survived and patients who didn't survive the four-year study period. Now we also have the optimal duality gaps for the reference pathways, which comes from phase one. Now using all of this, um, first let's see what are uh, the new constraints here. So this one is the optimal duality gap. It shows the optimal duality gap for the reference pathways. With this constraint, we make sure that this phase also will have the same level of optimality gap for the reference pathways that come from phase one. So basically this ensures that any optimal solution to this problem is also optimal for phase one. We then define the duality gaps for patient pathways with positive and negative outcomes. And now in the objective function, we minimize the duality gap for patients with positive outcomes and maximize it for patients with negative outcomes. So again, to summarize, what, uh, what does this formulation do? So first of all, it makes sure that the reference pathways are optimal solutions for the shortest path problem. That is just a priority. But in the second level, it makes sure that the patient data, patients who survived and patients who didn't survive, they are separated as much as possible. So that is what this formulation does. Okay, so we show that after we solve phase one and phase two, we can find an optimal solution, which is uh, which we can denote it by C star. So we have the C star and we use it in designing this concordance metric. Now the concordance metric can measure the concordance of any patient pathway. And it is easy, like after we find the cost vector, the optimal cost vector, the concordance metric is just basically the cost difference, cost difference of patient pathway and the shortest path on the graph. Now, all the other uh, terms over here, the denominator, this one minus, all of them are just for normalization purposes. And we just wanted to make sure that we have a metric with uh, nice properties. For example, uh, with this structure, the concordance metric is between zero and one. And one would show that the patient pathway is 100% concordant. Okay, um, now it, the fun part comes. If you have any questions before we go to the application, let me know. Uh, sorry, Dr. Nasrin, to interrupt. Would you please remind me what concordance means? I, I forgot somehow. Of course, yes. So the concordance means that uh, it is the degree of alignment between each patient pathway to the reference pathway. And the reference pathway is the ideal pathway that patients are supposed to go through. So for example, if a patient pathway has, so with this, we will have like a concordance score will be between zero and one. So if there is some patient with concordance score of 0.4 versus a patient with a concordance score of 0.80, the patient pathway with a score 0.80 is very close to the reference pathways compared to the other patients. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we had some data, real patient data, patients who were newly diagnosed with stage three colon cancer 
in province of Ontario in Canada. And uh, our collaborators from Cancer Care Ontario, which is an, a government agency here, who uh, they actually uh, divide like the funds for cancer. They, they uh, make sure that they monitor that, uh, you know, like the cancer care here, uh, they follow the guidelines and so on. So they have all this data on uh, patients with the stage two colon cancer. So one data was patients who were diagnosed in 2010, and the other data set included patients who were diagnosed between 2012 and 2016. Now we use the first data set to train the model. It means to solve the inverse model. So this is the patient data that we use in phase two of the model. And the second data set, we use that one for validating the metric using survival analysis. I will go over that. And also to find the sources of discordance using the points of discordance analysis. Just to give you an idea about like how many patients survived in these uh, two data sets. So 70% of patients survived the four year mark. Okay, so we use the patient data, the reference pathways to build this graph and we solve the, uh, the two phase inverse problem using the reference pathways, the patient data in the training set and we find the cost vector. So this is the optimal cost vector overlaid on the graph. As you see, like there were no constraints on the uh, sign of the cost vector. So it could be negative or positive. And because the forward problem is a shortest path problem, the, uh, the negative ones are rewarding. Okay, so the patients are encouraged to go through these arts. Anyways, yeah, we have this optimal cost vector and we, we could use it in the concordance metric to calculate the concordance score, which is a score between zero and one for each uh, patient pathway. Now, here is the distribution of the score in our patient data. Now, some of the patients have, uh, here is the concordance score. So the higher, the better. Some of the patients have very high concordance score, some others have very low ones. Now, the idea here is that to test whether the concordance metric that we find is associated with survival, whether they have any association or not. And if we can show that, then it will validate our metric because the uh, clinical pathways, the reference pathways, the ones that are ideal, they are created for to optimize patient survival, for example. And if we can prove that, then our metric is validated. Now to do that, we either could use the concordance metric as a continuous variable, because it is a continuous variable between zero and one, or we could also use tercials, just categorize the uh, patients to three categories, low, medium, and high concordant patients. Now, we actually performed the survival analysis using both approaches, the, uh, both models. And uh, before going into the results, like the rigorous analysis, survival analysis, I would like to show the kaplan meier curve, which um, is usually a good uh, overview of like what is happening, what you should expect from the data, but it is a crude analysis. We haven't considered anything else except for concordance uh, groups versus survival. So here is the survival probability over time. Okay? And in a kaplan meier curve, the lower category, it means like it has less survival, it has worse survival. So from this, we can observe that, yeah, it seems that patients with low concordance, they have also low survival. Now, just let's test it using a more proper approach. So we used Cox proportional hazards model, which is uh, just a survival analysis for sensor data. 
just like what uh, the data that we had. And with this analysis, we could adjust for some confounders, some potential confounders that can affect survival or the concordance method. So we adjusted for some demographics, uh, for example, gender, residency, immigration status, some comorbidity score, which can show the severity of the disease. Healthcare utilization, for example, how many times the patient was admitted to the hospital over the past year, and also some diagnostic and treatment characteristics, for example, a cancer substage. Now, before showing the results, uh, let me explain what we expect from this Cox model. So the Cox model will give a hazard ratio for each variable. Each variable that we include in the analysis, it will give some hazard ratio. And that ratio, it shows the effect of that variable on patient mortality. Now, if the ratio is less than one, it shows that there is a, uh, the variable has a negative effect on mortality and vice versa. Now, our variable of interest is concordance. So, what is the association between concordance score and mortality or slash survival? Now here, we have the two models that I mentioned. So the categorical model and the continuous model and the results from just running the analysis using the testing data, it shows that the hazard ratio for all of these models, it is less than one. So it shows that the concordance metric has a negative effect on mortality, which means that it has a positive effect on survival. So it actually validates the metric. The concordance metric is validated here. Now that the metric is validated, we can use it to uh, dig into the data and to find what are the reasons, what are the sources of discordance in the data? Does it come from this extra activity, that missing activity, or what is it? So to do that, we decompose each patient pathway to a set of detours. Now, what is a detour? Here is the definition. So a detour begins when the patient pathway deviates from the reference pathway, and it ends when the patient pathway rejoins the reference pathway. Let's see an example. So here is a reference pathway, and the one below that is a patient pathway, an actual patient pathway. Now, let's see if we can find the detours here. So the patient starts from the start node here. Then it has emergency department visit, which is not in the reference pathway. So it is discordant. So based on the definition, the patient has already, the patient pathway has already started to deviate from the reference pathway right at the start node. Okay. After that, we have endoscopy, which is concordant, fine. So here, the patient pathway rejoins the reference pathway. And that's how we find the first detour. Then we have pelvis CT, which is fine. But after that, we have surgery, which suggests that chest imaging is missing over here, okay? So we have just find the second detour. So the second detour starts from pelvis CT and ends at surgery. Chemotherapy is just concordant, so fine. So overall, we have find two detours for this patient pathway. Now, if we look closely to each of the detours, for example, detour number one, we can see that there are some arcs that don't exist in the reference pathway. I'm showing those arcs by red. So for example, a start to emergency department visit doesn't exist in the reference pathway, right? So these are just extra arcs and they are discordant. 
On the other hand, there are some arts that they exist uh, in the reference pathway, but they don't exist in the patient pathway, like this one. So this is the dashed uh, arrow. So we observe that any detour in any patient pathway, it has this property. So there are some extra arcs and there are some missing arcs. So uh, inspired by that, we define the cost of a detour. So each detour will be assigned a cost using the cost vector that we find using the inverse problem. So the detour cost, it will be just basically the cost, the sum of the costs of the extra arcs minus the sum of the costs of the uh, missing concordant arcs. That is just uh, that simple. And in the denominator, we are just normalizing again. Now, in an important theorem, we show that the total discordance of a patient pathway is equal to the sum of the cost of the detours, okay? So for example, the discordance score, the discordance score is actually one minus the concordance score. For example, if the patient pathway has a concordance score of 0.40, then its uh, discordance score is 0.60. So the discordance score of this patient pathway is equal to the cost of detour number one and detour number two. So this theorem help us to, uh, it helped us to uh, actually decompose each patient pathway and then aggregate the patient pathways over the patient population and find like the types of detours in the patient population and even look at, uh, look inside the detours and see what is causing this uh, this to be a detour, for example. For example, this detour is a detour because there is an emergency department visit in between, right? So we uh, ran like this source of analysis and we find some insights from the patient data. I'm just uh, summarizing the insights here. So first of all, so this is the reference pathway that I showed you uh, before. So let's just see what are some points of discordance that we find in the data. So first of all, we observe that as patients go through the, the cancer treatment, they accumulate more and more discordance. And in particular, they become uh, more discordant after surgery. Another point of discordance was that most of the patients are missing endoscopy which is like the first step, but almost 50% of patients miss endoscopy. Another point of discordance was having emergency department visits and especially in the diagnosis uh, part of the pathway. And finally, extra imaging also plays a major role in population discordance. So extra imaging is especially after surgery is uh, like a major contributor to discordant in the patient population too. So observing all of this, we had some sessions with our clinical uh, collaborators and we brainstormed some ideas, how we can act to eliminate all these, you know, uh, quality gaps from the system. So basically the idea is that uh, to be able to eliminate these quality gaps, the policymakers they should, uh, they should monitor uh, their reasons. Uh, they should uh, go and find the reasons. What are the reasons behind uh, patients, behind the fact that patients are missing endoscopy, for example? So, um, some examples here. For example, if patients are missing endoscopy because they just present to the emergency department, then maybe policymakers should focus on initiatives that will increase the screening participation in the patient uh, in, in general population, actually. On the other hand, if 
patients are missing endoscopy because they can't have access to uh, endoscopy services, which is a reality in Canada. Sometimes you have to wait for such services like endoscopy or MRI for a few months. So in that case, maybe they should invest in improving the capacity in the system. Or for example, for the emergency department visit, uh, it turns out that most of the emergency department visits are avoidable, avoidable. So the majority of the ones that don't end up in hospitalization, they are avoidable. So the policymakers should consider some other services maybe like a telephone triage service to, uh, to just add Add to the system and monitor for a while. And our concordance metric can help that to monitor for a while and to see whether this improves concordance in the system. And finally, extra imaging activities, which are also main points of discordance, especially after surgery, there is also a way for that. For example, maybe they should add more follow ups in their clinical guidelines so that to make sure that patients stay on track even after the surgery and after the discharge. So to summarize, we developed a two-phase inverse optimization approach for measuring clinical pathway concordance. And we applied it to real patient data for patients with a stage three colon cancer. We validated the metric using a survival analysis, and we find the sources of discordance in the patient population. We could then uh, give some um, action items to policymakers, and hopefully, uh, right now we are still in contact with the people in Cancer Care Ontario, and hopefully uh, all these concordance metrics and the suggestions that we had, they will be implemented. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Let's see if we can.